Hey folks, welcome to another Geometry Nodes tutorial. In this one, we're going to be looking at how to make this funky bench, parametric bench. It's made out of curves along another curve. This tutorial, we're going to cover a bunch of tools, building tools that are generally applicable. So more than just on this bench, you're going to be able to use this for making any kinds of shapes, uh, especially if you can define them with curves to begin with. And then all of the extra stuff that comes along with that to make sure that you have the control that you need uh, because there's a few things that can trip you up with this for example a lot of the other solutions that you'll find online have this kind of result where you have a linear interpolation in fact the one that we're doing here is still subdividing within that space not actually subdividing we're setting a specific resolution so you can see i can change my resolution and it will affect without changing the linear interpolation when it's smooth obviously this is generally more what people are looking for and again we can set our resolutions however there's a few things if i mute this reverse curve you can see that we get these twists in here and that is also not desirable this is because of curve direction so we're going to learn how to evaluate the direction of the curve based on what we're looking for and then fix it where appropriate so that's all procedural as well and lastly, we're going to make sure that we have a nice, easy control system for where our splines go. For example, rather than saying these have to be made in a specific order, I can just move it to where I want it to be. And now it's over here. So you can have total control over the order of your profiles just by dragging them around in world space. So that's a really nice workflow. Before we get into the main tutorial, if you want to be learning geometry nodes and getting up to a nice high level, I have some courses on the topic. Currently, you can go and check out Node Group, linked down below, which has three brand new simulation nodes courses covering uh, Bouncing Ball, which is basic physics, Boids, which is like flocking schools of animals, and we also have Erosion for large scale landscape erosion. Node Group is a new platform and I'm going to be uploading more and more courses in the future, so definitely get on board with that. Let's jump into Blender. First thing we're going to be doing in here is creating our object to contain our geometry nodes. We'll be making a bench ultimately, so let's call it that to begin with. And I also need a new collection, which is going to be my curves. The first port of call is going to be building up our lofting setup. It is quite a simple setup, but you need to know a few things about how indexing works and things like that. So I'm going to walk you through this first. We need some curves, so let's go ahead and just add some Beziers in our 3D viewport. That is fine for this one. Let's maybe make this a bit different. And then maybe I'll grab a third one over onto this side as well. Again, subdivide and I'll pull up that middle. Okay, so I just have three quite simple curves here. Nothing too fancy. These are not going to be sorted. They are simply going to be used in the order that we made them in. So things will come like this. We're working with collections just because it's a little bit easier for us to think about rather than having multiple splines within the same object. Also makes it more editable. Uh, this is one of those constraints with working procedurally. It's often easier for you to work with some 3D viewport controls, some real objects that you can use as controllers. On our bench object, let's create a new node tree in here. I'm going to call this one bench as well. And I'm going to pin this node tree because we're not going to leave this. Let's drag our curves collection in and I will disable it in my viewport. And there we go. Now we can see that we just have that. Let's delete the group input. We don't need that now. Collection infos bring in instances, as you can see on the node. So let's also use a realize instances node just to make these real. For doing a loft, essentially we want to make a quad mesh that comes over the surface. So I'm gonna show you the simple method first, and then we're going to expand into the more complex workflow. So with a simple loft, if we look at this, we have a number of points along our curves, and we need these really to be the same along each curve. So to begin with, we will resample our curves. That's curve operations, resample curve, and we will set a specific number. I'm gonna use 10 for now. And in fact, I will pull this off onto an integer because we will need it later. 
Now we can go straight from here to having a simple loft. And you might think, oh, how do we make this geometry? But actually we're going to borrow it. So let's use a mesh primitives grid. And we can take this grid, we can set the position of the points based on the positions of our curves. So we are going to need to sample by index from our curves, from our splines. We're looking for a vector. This is going to be the position. And the index is going to be just the index. So 0, 0.0 will go to 0, 0.0, 0.1 will go to 0.1. Now, if we plug this into the position of our set position, you can see that something has happened. It's not quite right though. At the moment, the grid does not have the same amount of topology as our curves did. Our curves are 10 points long and three, go one, two, three points across. So we need to make sure that our grid is the same. Let's take our X into that X. And now when we view the position, you can see that this isn't quite right either. So the order that we do things in is going to be important as well, because as you can see, we have 10 by three, and it looks like we're going to need three by 10. And now you can see that these are stretching across the points properly. So this is, um, this is literally all you have to do. If you want a simple loft where you're not doing anything fancy with your resolution, you're not doing any interpolation and smoothing or anything like that, this is good enough. If you want to just make this very slightly more complicated, but not hugely more, then you can, instead of using a grid, you could use a mesh primitives cylinder. And with this, let's plug this in, let's make sure we have the right numbers. So if we think about a cylinder here, we have vertices for our points around the circle, and we have side segments for our points up the side. Something to be aware of with your side segments. If I set this to two, we actually have one, two, three rings. So just something to be aware of there. So in this case, we are looking for 10 by two. And if I zoom out, here we go. Looks a little bit odd, but now you can see that we have uh, an sort of an encapsulated, a closed off volume using a cylinder. So that is an option for you. Obviously you can go for none instead and you're gonna open up these ends rather than them being uh, solid. All right, so that's how you make a closed volume shape. Let's take this up to the next level though. We want some interpolation. We want some intelligence in our system. How do we do this? Well, rather than evaluating a grid over these curves, we are simply going to use other curves and we want to draw those curves in this direction. We can then choose how we resample them to set a resolution and then we can choose whether or not we are going to set them as smoothed curves or linear curves. So then we have all of that control that we want for both the smooth shapes and the linear shapes. I'm going to go ahead and just delete that set position and the sample. So we've just got our curves coming in. Let's resample these ones to be curves. So frame them to be curves. And then we're setting the resolution of these curves. First thing that we want here is our curves to be the ribs. So we're going to instance curves along the first spline, and then we need to just set the positions basically. Take an instance on points node on your resample curve. We are going to be instancing a curve line, but not everywhere. We want to make sure it's only on spline zero. So to do this, we're going to make sure we're using the selection here. Let's take the index. And we're interested in the spline index. So let's evaluate this on the domain integer. We're looking for splines. And then I can put this through a compare node to find out when it is equal to zero. And there we have it. So nice and easy. Now we just have points on spline zero. Now the lines themselves, we need to make sure that we have enough points that they can start on one point, come up to the next curve, and then come down to the next curve. So we need as many points as there are curves. Now I could just say resample curve, set this to three, and there we go, we're done. However, what happens if I add more curves? I want this to update automatically. So we're gonna take our resample curve. We are going to use a domain size node. 
which I will set to curve. And now we can take our spline count into the resample curve. And now we have a proper analytical system that is creating the correct number of points per spline. So now we have curves on our first point. So let's realize these so that we can work with them. And then let's also use a set position node so that we can set the position. Um, we are interested in the positions from our resample curve up here. So let's just move these back a little way. And I'm going to pull this underneath. So let's use a sample index node. And I'll just reroute that with shift, right click and drag. Set this to vector because we're using the positions and the index. Let's start with the index node. And let's plug this in, let's see how this goes. Okay, so almost perfect, but not quite. And why is this? Well, if we think about the actual curves, and let's just come back so that we can see them, I'll resample, here we go. If we think about the indices going along these curves, we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine along this one, and then this one is gonna start at 10, up to 19, and then 20, up to 29. Right, so the direction of our indexes is like this. So when it comes to the end of here, it's going to stretch up to the next one. Uh, we want to do a process called flipping indices. We want to flip the direction of the indices from this way along our imaginary grid to this way along our imaginary grid. So that if you think about this as already being a grid, rather than it going zero, one, counting up, we want it to go zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, right? So we need to change the order of our vertices. How do we do this? Well, I've got a tutorial on it. If you want the deep dive, I'll be linked up above and I will explain it here as well. It is uh, mathematically quite simple, but it just takes a little bit of working through. So let's jump into that. If you have ETK, you can actually just skip this. There's a fields flip index in here. So you can just use that instead. But essentially <laughs> what we want to do here is taking our index. Let's write this out. I'm going to do this in full just so that we can work out what's going on. Let's use a few colors. So if I have a grid in here, let's do a four by three. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. This is approximately what we're seeing with our splines. What I want to have happen is for it to be like this. So each number is actually mapped onto a different number. Zero is going to be zero, one is going to be three, two is going to be six, three is going to be nine. Now, is there anything that you can see about these numbers? We have a grid which is three tall, and we're seeing this is basically the three times table, right? Zero, three, six, nine, one, four, seven, ten, two, five, eight, eleven. These are just adding three each time. If we ignore that this is plus one and this is plus two, then what all of these are is simply zero, three, six, nine, right? This one is just one higher. This one is just two higher. So if we can make everything just be zero, three, six, nine, then we're onto a winner. And zero, one, two, three just needs to be multiplied by three to do that. If I take my index and I modulo by a number, in this case four, because we're going four long. So let's take an integer, which will be four. What we're gonna see is modulo returns the remainder after a division. So if I divide by four, then we have zero divided by four is zero, remainder zero. One divided by four is zero, remainder one. Two is gonna be zero, remainder two. Three is gonna be zero, remainder three. When we hit four, you're going to see that go back to zero because it goes in one time but a remainder of zero and then five goes in once but with a remainder of one so we can actually create this repeating zero one two three pattern if we modulo by four now i have zero one two three zero one two three zero one two three let's multiply this by three so we're going to multiply by our other dimension here and then what I need to do is I need to find some way 
to calculate when this row, this block, the first one, is equal to zero. The second one is going to all be equal to one, and the third one is all going to be equal to two, so that I can just add that to our values. Because this one was plus one, this one is plus two. Take your index, and you're going to divide it this time by four. So now we have zero, quarter, half, three quarters, and then four is going to be one, one and a quarter, one and a half, one and three quarters. And then if we floor this, that is just going to return the integer. So then we're going to get zero, 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 one, 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 and so on. And then we can simply add these together with an add node. And now you have flipped your indices. This is a super useful node group. It might seem a bit niche, but it is genuinely very useful. Let's frame this up. Control G to put it into a group, sorry, group it up. And we are going to be making a new output for it on the group tab here. Let's add a new integer, which is just going to be our index. Then on our inputs, we can name these. The one that goes into two, I think this is the V resolution. And that will go to the bottom. And then the other one is the U resolution. So I'm thinking about these in terms of our direction around a grid. Go and I can just remove those with control X. All right, this is our node group done. Save, tab out. Let's call this one flip indices. Super useful node. I'm going to just erase, get rid of all of those annotations there. And we can now use this instead of this index. Let's see what happens when I plug this in. So let's view our set position. So this is obviously incorrect. If we use our flip indices instead, so nothing happens when these are both set to zero. Let's set one of these to three and the other one to 10. So that's not quite right either. So it means that we need to have this as being 10 by three. And there you go. Now you can see that these are counting correctly around our grid. 10 and 3, where did I pull those numbers out of? Well, that is the number of splines we have. And the 10 comes from the resolution of our resample curve up here. So let's join this into our U resolution. All right, let's start off with our smoothed interpolation because we're very close to just lofting at this point. In order for us to do a smooth interpolation, we are very simply going to use a curve right set spline type. You have a few options. You can either set it to Bezier and then use a curve right set handle type to auto. That is one option. I find it gives slightly strange looking results. I would much rather see Catmull ROM. I think it's a little bit more predictable. Uh, it just gives you a little bit of a better shape, I think. And then what we can do with this is we can resample it to give ourselves the resolution that we're looking for in that direction. And then we can simply sample this by index a vector position by index onto a grid. So once again, let's add a grid node with its own set position. Taking the position from the sample index, let's view the output there. Very broken. We need some more resolution. So let's base this on our resample curve here, drag off an integer. Like this and then the other one is going to be based on let's zoom right out this original integer as well now these are 10 by 10 so i just need to make sure that i'm doing this correctly let's set this to 15 there we go that is the correct order for what we're after okay this looks pretty good nice and smooth we have all the control that we want and it's it's working great so let's frame these ones up here Control j this one is going to be our smooth interpolation. Now, before we get into linear interpolation, I'm actually going to make this all into one big node group. So let's tab in. So after the curves, I want the curves to be on the outside. I'm going to frame all of the nodes that we just made. Control G into a frame, tab back out. Let's name this one loft curves. Tabbing back in we're going to make some new inputs. So this integer at the beginning, this one is our U resolution on our flip indices. So I'm just going to set this to be our U resolution. So let's add a new 
group input here. It's going to be an integer. It's going to be called U resolution. And we're going to make sure that it is between um, and the least we want is going to be two, which would be a straight line between points. So there we go. And the max is fine for that. So I'm going to set this into my count. And I'm also going to make sure that I'm using this group input. I'm just going to duplicate it. U resolution into my flip indices. Where else are we using this? Up here on that grid. So let's duplicate up another one and plug it in. There we go. Keeps our node tree nice and organized. This other setting here that we have in our smooth interpolation, this is going to be our V resolution. So let's add a new input, rename this one to V resolution, and I'm going to plug this into my grid as well as into my count of that resample node. I can now delete that integer, making sure that my minimum here is going to be two and my max is some value. If I come out here, you can see everything's disappeared. We just need to make sure that our resolution on the node group is a bit more sensible. Let's set it to both 30. And there we have it. This is how you can make a simple, but less simple, I guess, <laughs> a smooth loft curves. And it's nice and easy for you to, uh, to set up however you want. And another nice thing we can do is let's just plug our UV map straight to the outside and maybe also rename your output to mesh just to make sure that you know exactly what's going on. Now you can see we have a surface with a proper UV map. Nice. And we're not done yet. We want to also have the option of a linear interpolation. So remember when we first did our simple loft and you had all the angles and everything was just sharp to points. We want to do that here as well, but with the added feature of being able to set the resolution in like in all of those spaces. Now, if I mute set spline type, then it sort of does it, but you can see here over the ridge, it steps across and we're getting some really ugly um, triangulation, I guess, sort of creasing these faces because the grid is independent of where the curves go underneath it, which is kind of nice in some ways, but in other ways, it's not so good. So if you want a linear interpolation, we want to do this in a slightly cleaner way. So underneath our smooth interpolation grid, we're going to do a linear interpolation. And this is a little bit different. So let's go back to our set position. This time, I want to take all of these curves and I want to split them into individual sections. I can then resample those sections into their resolution that I want. And then I can use that to loft over. So there's a couple of steps here. First of all, we want to split these into individual sections. This is best done with a mesh. So grab a curve to mesh. I just searched CTM for that. And now if I use the duplicate elements node, this has the effect when set to edge with a count of one of essentially exploding your mesh. So this is a really useful tool. If I actually apply that geometry nodes, and I tab into edit mode and I grab edges, you can see that I can move this and it leaves all of the other ones behind. So I've now broken this into individual elements. Let's undo that back to our node group. There we go. So all of our edges are independent. Now let's grab a meshed curve, MTC. Now we have curves and we can resample these. Now, I have another problem. At the end of each one of these curves where they join, we have two points in the same place. If we were to just do a loft now, you would lose an entire edge and you would have additional vertices that you're not really expecting. So once again, curve to mesh, we are going to merge by distance. And then we're going to do yet again, mesh to curve. So now we have got rid of all of those points in the middle that we don't want. Once again, we are going to just put all of this onto a grid. So let's add a new grid node. I'm just keeping it separate to the other one just for clarity. Let's grab a grid. It's going to have its own set position. From our mesh to curve, we are going to sample index vector. That's going to be the position and the index here. And then we can just plug this into our position. There we go. Let's have a look at this. All right, grid not looking so hot. What can we do about that? Well, 
we need a few more points. But how many points? Well, certainly we can use the group input up here. So our U resolution, this we can use to know how long it is in this direction. So U resolution into vertex X, that's not looking too promising. So what number do we want? Let's just try until we find out when it works. There it is, 19. When our resample curve is set to 10, we want 19 points. Why is this? Well, if we think about it, if we have two edges, we've split them off, we've resampled them to each have 10 points, we've then joined them back together and we've merged one point in the middle. So now we've got 10 plus 10 minus one. It's not always going to be minus one though, because if we have three points or four points or five points, or whatever, then, you know, let's say we have four times 10, that's 40, but we're going to be getting rid of three vertices. So it's actually going to be 37. A way that we can work out how to do this or how what this number is going to be is with a domain size node. So let's grab our mesh to curve. Let's grab a domain size. And let's just have a look at some numbers in our curve domain. Let's go to our control points. Here we go. So our point count is 418. Our spline count is 22 and 418 divided by 22 is equal to 19. So we can simply take point count, divide by spline count. There we go, now this is 19. We can use this as our grid vertices and this is always going to work. What about our V resolution on here? The V resolution is the number of points that we have between the start and the end of our entire loft. If I just plug this straight into the count here, then we're gonna get the entire resolution between the start and end of each segment. And that is not what we're after. So let's have a think about this. And I will also just add one more curve at the end here, just to make sure that we have a little bit more to look at. Cool. Looks nice. So with our resolution, let's say that it's 30. In this case, we're going to be splitting this into tens. That logically makes sense. We have three segments. So let's divide by three. And that's going to give us 10. And then when we merge by distance, we're actually going to be losing two points because we have these two in the middle. So that's going to be down to 28. Okay, so we've lost a couple. It's not really in the right zone anymore. But what happens when we set this to 31? Well, divided by three, that is going to be 10 and a third. But the resample curve is going to floor that. So that's actually just going to read as 10. And in which case, we're going to go to 28 again. What about 32? Well, divided by three, that's going to be 10.6 integer here is going to floor it. So it's actually going to be read as a 10. We're going to have 28. By this point, we are four values out in terms of our error. So we're getting quite far away from where we want to be. What about 33? Well, divided by three, this one's going to be 11, which we're going to lose. So then we're going back to 33. Now we're at 31. So as you can see, we're having a bit of a problem with always underestimating where we want to be anywhere between two below to four below. And that's just with four curves. There's a little bit of math we can do to improve this. So first of all, let's calculate what we just did. So let's take our V resolution. Let's divide it by the number of segments, which is the number of curves with a domain size node. Spline count, subtract one. So we have four curves, subtract one, that gives us three. That's the number of segments. Now we have the correct value here. Let's floor this as well, just so that we know where we are stood. Now, we were always below. So let's just try adding a one to this. Let's add one at this end. So let's think about this. We have 30. We're dividing it by three. Uh, we're going to be flooring it. And then we're going to add one 
and let's see where we get to. So 30 divided by 3 floored is 10. Uh, 10 plus 1 is obviously 11. And then we can do times 3 minus 2 in this case. So that is going to be 33 minus 2 is 31. So we're only one away up, but only one away. 31 divided by 3 and floored is going to be 10. So as you can see, this one's going to be 31. That is correct. 32 divided by 3 is going to be 10.6. So floored is going to be 10. So as you can see, this one's going to be 31 as well. So we're only one below. 33, this one's going to be 11. Plus 1 is 12. Times 3 is 36. Minus 2 is 34. So now we're only one above. So as you can see, now doing this, we are very close It'll hold its value for a couple of steps, but that is to be expected um, when we're doing this kind of discrete situation. It has to be rounded to threes because of how we're working out our segments. Let's take these. We're going to plug that back into our account here. There we are. Just put this underneath. Let's frame this up as being our V resolution estimate. There we go. And I will also just join all of this with our grid work, set position, that sample that we made as well. And let's frame these all up into our linear interpolation. Great, now we just need to switch between these. So let's grab a switch node. Our smooth interpolation is going to be true. Our linear is going to be false. And there we go, that's on that mesh output now. Let's use another group input node, Alt P to remove from that frame. And I will add a new input on here for linear forward slash smooth. Set this to a Boolean and that's fine. There we go. We can plug in like this. Let's tap back out. Let's make sure that we're viewing the correct socket. There we go. And now I can switch between linear and smooth, and you can see that the resolution is not jumping by much. It looks pretty much the same between the both of them. So now we have our finished loft curves, not quite finished. You can see that smooth has UVs, linear does not. So to do this, we just need to use a vector math, so utility vector vector math, add. So we're just gonna simply add that vector that we had before to the UV map of our other grid as well. And now you can see both of these have UVs. Okay, so that is lofting. That's how we can do that. The next thing that we want to do is actually start working on our bench. So there's a few things to do here, nothing overly complex. So let's jump in to our outliner. We have our curves collection. I'm going to make a new collection for bench profiles. And I'm going to do another new collection for bench path. So the path is going to be sort of the, the flow, the general shape of the bench as viewed from above. And the profiles is going to be the cut through like a cross section at each point that we're going to be doing our interpolation between. I will just cut my input. There we go. And let's just start in here. So bench path, let's add a new Bezier curve. This bench is around about two meters long. Is that okay? Maybe we'll make it a little bit bigger. I want it to be quite, you know, interesting. Let's maybe add another subdivide that curve. We'll do something like this. Maybe I don't want to do too much of a shape right now. We can play with it once we actually have the volume on there. So I'll go with this for my bench path. And then in my bench profiles, I am going to, I'm just going to start up here. I like to keep these separate just so that I can view them as I'm working. And let's just full screen this. I want to make sure that my, I'll just work to a line here. So I'm going to scale this down. I'm going to turn off my normals. That's what those arrows are, by the way, my curve normals. And I'm just going to make sure that this is I'll find some kind of shape for it. So maybe we start with our ends as being quite small. Something like this. And then let's just make a bunch of these. Let's make seven. 
of these curves and then we're just going to shape each one as we go here. So this first one, let's scale these up a little bit. Let's right click subdivide. We can set our seat shape starting to come in here. So a little bit of a, a hump with a bump in the middle. Let's grab our next one. Again, we'll scale this up. In fact, you know what? Let's get rid of those that we just made. Now that we have a seat defined, and actually, do you know what? A seat should be around about 400 mil off the ground. So it should be somewhere around here, actually. Let's work to that assumption. Let's work on something a little bit more realistic here. Okay. So let's make a few of these instead. Now that we've got the size defined. So this next one, maybe I right click, make a new point on the back. Now this is, I'm doing this quite, you know, rapidly. So spend a little bit more time, work out exactly the shapes that you're after. And then, yes, you can have a lot of fun with this. So with a few of these, I'm also just going to, um, I'm going to do something which I know is going to break it, but I think it's important that we are aware of some of our problems here. So if I show my normals, you can see the direction that this is traveling around the curve. That is the curve tangent. If I right click, actually, let's just do it this way. Let's scale X minus. So now you can see this one's going counterclockwise, which means that we're going to cause some problems later. I want this to happen because I want to show you how to fix it. So we have a few of these curves in this direction. Let's just um, maybe grab a couple of these end ones as well. Maybe I'll scale them down a little bit and I'll scale this one down a bunch more. So apply rotation and scale. So this is what I want to see along my curve here. Coming back to our node tree. We're going to bring in our bench path and our bench profiles collections. And we're going to set our bench path to be relative, just so that I can't move it with my object. I mean, that's personal preference. Maybe you do want to be able to move it with your object. Yeah. Do you know what? Let's move it with the object. <laughs> let's leave it as original. And then what we want is this is a collection. So instances, let's realize those instances. And we're going to resample this to have as many points as we have profile curves. So let's also grab a resample curve node and the number of instances in our other collection. Let's use a domain size node set to instances with our instance count. There we go. Now you're thinking, where did this go? But it's because we haven't separated those instances, which meant they were coming through as a single instance. You need separate instances on to make sure that they come through as individual. I'm also going to set this to reset children just because we're going to want to use this later to actually, um, well, as you can see, we want them to not be over here. We want them to be down here. So all on one spot. Let's make a bit of space. We're going to just instance on points the instances of this bench profiles collection. We're going to be picking an instance per point and we need to make sure that these are going to be standing up. So let's define the rotation. First thing I want to do is try to align Euler to vector. We're going to be aligning the curve tangent to the Z axis. If you look at our splines here, the curve tangent wants to be moving in that direction relative to our uh, profiles. That's how we've drawn them on the flat. Let's align that to the Z axis. So these are all going nicely. And we also want to make sure that we're aligning the Y axis to the world Z. So let's have a look at how we do this. I'm going to show you the wrong way first, and then we're going to talk about it. So let's take another align Euler to vector. We're going to be taking the Y axis and aligning it to 0, 0, 001. Now in this case, it did actually work all right, but this is just something to be aware of. 
you want to be careful the order that you do your aligns in. Generally speaking, it would be more robust to do it in this order. And the reason is because these are evaluated X, Y, Z. So if you do a Y rotation followed by a Z rotation, it's more likely to get it correct and not end up in gimbal lock than if you do a Z and then a Y. So that's just a, a, little, a little tip for you there. All right, if I just plug this into my loft curves, we're not gonna see anything happen. We need to realize these instances. So let's realize instances and here we go. So do you remember when I made sure that one of my curves was going the other direction? This is the curve making this part. So you can see that it's flipped. This is red because I've got my, my face orientation on just to make it easier for us to see this. But you can see that we want to make sure that whatever is happening to our curves, we're making them go in the correct direction. They always want to be in the same direction. And as well, like sometimes you might have flipped some of these, you know, you might have changed the direction that some of these are going with. If I take a switch into here and let's make all of these one to begin with, then we're gonna make some of them minus one randomly. Okay, we want to be able to do that proceduralism. We want to be able to layer on this kind of uh, automated control for our profiles without having it break the bench. The way that we can do this is by looking at the curve tangents. So let's have a look at this. Fair warning, we are going to be touching cross product. I will explain it, but just so you know, <laughs> there's some maths incoming here. If we have a look at our input curve and we have a look at our profile curves, we have not a huge amount of information. We do have a curve tangent for each one, so I can view the tangent at each point along these curves, and I can view the tangent at each point along this curve. For a start, I'm not interested in the curve tangent along the entire curve. You know, some of this is going up, I don't care. I just want to know the direction from the start to the end point. A nice easy way for us to work this out is to use a resample curve with a count of two. So now I just have a fixed value, um, a single edge as it were, going from the start to the end of my splines. You can see one of them is clearly different. Now we also have the tangent of our curve, our base curve. So this one is going in this direction. We have other ones which are either coming this way or this way. And I want to know if they're going left or right. To do this, we can actually use a little bit of vector math. It's very easy for us to work with, so don't be put off by that. We are just going to take the curve tangent and using the vector 0, 0, 1, the up vector, we are going to cross product these against each other. You can visualize this in your head as these two vectors create a triangle. The triangle has a normal direction, just as any mesh would, that points at 90 degrees away from both of these edges. So we know that we have a tangent and we want to know a 90 degree perpendicular vector away from it. If I can then find this vector that I have just calculated using the cross product, I can compare this against all of my other vectors. And they're either going to be the same direction or they're going to be the opposite vector. So this is just going to take us a minute, but it's worth knowing this kind of thing because analytically being able to fix your um, procedural systems, it frees up a lot of guesswork. It stops you from needing to manually put in values which are then going to prevent you from having a properly interconnected procedural system. We want this to be scalable, this system. We want to be able to just add curves however we want and to have it work. So what we need is this value, the curve tangent, but we need it to exist on these. So let's grab a an attribute, capture attribute. We're gonna be capturing the vector curve tangent. Here we go, on the point domain. What I can then do is uh, just read it off on our instances. So anything which is captured on the instances or the points 
during the realize instance node, it will be inherited correctly. So that's how we now have access to it. I was saying about cross product before, let's just run through that. So vector math on here, we are looking for the cross product between our tangent value and 001. Now you can see that these all have a nice little vector on them. Most of them are dark though, right? We can now compare these against our curve tangents of our short lines. So let's use a compare node, which will be set to vector between our curve tangent and our cross product. We're interested in doing a dot product here. Now dot product, when we have two vectors that point the same direction, we will get a value of one from dot product. When they are opposite directions, we will get a value of minus one. When they are at 90 degrees, you will get a value of zero. So we are interested in when it is greater than zero, when this is greater than zero, which means essentially that they're more similar in their direction. So you can see that this one is the only one which stands out. I want to use this Boolean to go through an, a curve reverse curve node on our original profiles. So not these ones, we want to do it on our originals, which means we need to sample this by index. We are sampling a Boolean from this greater than onto these reversed curves. Now let's check our loft curves. Let's see if that worked. It did nothing. So what we're interested in is setting this index to be the spline index. So we're going to be transferring this by spline. So let's change our sample index type from point to spline. We're going to be looking for an index node, which I will put through an evaluate on domain to push this onto the spline domain. There we go. So that's how this works. Basically we find the spline index and we transfer from spline to spline entirely, not point to point, spline to spline. Now, mine is still inside out. You could always do a flip normals or you could just ignore it, which is what I'm going to do. Right, so we're well on our way now to having a finished system. So we fixed our, fixed the directions. We've done our lofting. Um, something I might do here as well is I will just shade smooth. There we go, nice. And the last thing that we want to do, these curves, how do I set the order of them? Right now, I would have to actually come in here. I'd have to change the number on this. Like if I set this up to 14 and then I need to get this to trigger an update somehow. Um, there we go. That is now how you would do that. So I can set number 10 to number 15. Come in here, tab, there we go. So not good, not an ideal workflow. I want this to be based on the X position, the world X position of our spline. How do we do that? That sounds complicated. Well, it's actually quite straightforward once you know how. We can use the instance index of our instance on points nodes, let's just view this, to pick which curve goes in which position. So for example, zero is going to be zero, one is going to be one, but maybe this one here over here. So this one is currently number six, but maybe we want this one to actually be at the end in position eight. We just need to find an integer per point that tells it which curve to go for. The method I'm going to show you now for sorting is going to be slightly different in Blender 4, but not by much. And the one that I'm going to show you is going to work anyway. It's just there's a more optimal method coming. So let's start off with a curve, curve topology node. We're going to be using the points of curve node. The reason is that we can sort things by weight. And the weight in this case is going to be a separate x, y, z, x from the position. Okay. So control H on there, there we go. So the position X is going to be my weight for the order of these. Now I need to know the curve index value as well. And to do this, we need the curve topology curve of point. So each point that is evaluated, it's going to find which curve it's going to be evaluated on and it will be itself. 
And then for the sort index, we are going to do this by index. So each point is evaluated. So we now have a sort weighting that we can use and take your bench path. This is the one that we're going to use to evaluate the order of the points. So let's take our resampled one. Actually, we will need the correct number of points on here. Let's drag this down. And I want to position the points of this curve on the positions of our benches. So let's take a set position node. And we are going to sample the positions. We are going to sample by index the vector position by index. So one to one, two to two, etc. And we're not working in the point domain, we're working in the instance domain because this is a collection info. And there we go, everything disappears. So why is this? Well, the reason I split off another collection info node is because we actually need for this one, in this case, to not reset the children. So as you can see, if I move this up in the x-axis, there we go, you can see that this line is going all over the place. However, now we actually have a line, a, a curve specifically, we can use those topology nodes that we just did. If I view both of these, then you can see there is no viewer output, right? So we can do the viewer, but this doesn't work. So you're gonna to have to kind of take me at face value for this, that it works. So this is our sorting. I have a curve. I want to sample the index onto this instance. So let's duplicate our sample index. This is going to be an integer from our point index. I'm gonna set this to point. And this time we are transferring again by index. Let's view these. I can now take my sample index into that instance index. And there we go, it just kind of works now. Let's frame up these nodes we just made, control J. This is going to be our order by X position. There we go. And now if we have a look at our loft curves node, let's join that to the output. Now we have a bench. Let's move some things around. So now if I move these, you can see that I am reordering those bench profiles. How cool is that? Let's maybe add, and this is the other thing as well, like we can just add more profiles now because they're not sorted by name. They are sorted by position that we draw them. Maybe I go for another one. And then maybe I take my base curve here, my profile or my path. And then we can set that up here. Maybe we need a little bit more resolution. Let's increase our V resolution. And our U resolution a little bit. And there we go. Now we're getting a nice little bench to work with here. I hope you've enjoyed this workflow. There's a lot that we just covered here, a lot to unpack. So Definitely take some time, work through the exercise if you didn't, and see what other ways you can apply this. Loft curves is very useful. I know a lot of people request it as a general node in Blender, but this is one of those things that we're only ever going to see as node group assets. So I would expect the Blender Foundation will release more modeling centric node groups at some point, but this won't be like a core node. This will always be a node group but it does mean that you can always break into it and make it do whatever you need in your situation. There's also a lot of other things that we touched on here, analyzing curve direction and flipping the ones which are doing what we don't want. We've also dealt with ordering things and sorting things. And we also did the flipping indices as well. So there's a lot of stuff in here. I hope that was fun. Hope it was enjoyable for you. Hope you learned something and I'll catch you in another one real soon.